Hour number three on a Sunday get-together here on CBS Sports Radio. Jody Mack coming your way live from the Rocket Mortgage Studios. Need to know what it takes for a home to fit your life and your budget? Rocket can. All right, I'm not always completely flabbergasted like the lead-in said. Sometimes I know what I'm talking about. And if I don't know enough, what I do is I get guests up who know more than me so that uh, we all can understand what's going down in the world of sports. Some interesting stuff with the Colts. Kind of a fly-under-the-radar type deal they made this week. I'm going to talk about that in their offseason with Luke Diamond, who is the host and producer of the For the Culture podcast that would be c-o-l-t-u-r-e very 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 good name i enjoy the uh, name of it i'm gonna enjoy talking to luke for the next 5 10 15 minutes luke jody mack here on cbs sports radio how you doing jody how you doing i appreciate you having me on and thank you for not only giving the name but also spelling it out correctly for the play on words there before the culture it is a very good play on words. I'm a fan of play on words, and I think yours is outstanding. All right, uh, as I said before, I punched you up in the segment. Um, a lot of big names changed teams since free agency kicked in, trades, wide receivers, big time called the Sean Watson deal, and the like. I thought the Matt, Wire, uh, Matt Ryan acquisition last week was an under-the-radar, really deft move by the Indianapolis Colts. They were right to move away from Carson Wentz. How has Ryan's arrival in Indianapolis played so far with Colt Nation? A lot better, I would say, than this time last year. And you could go back two years. Rivers was really good for that one-year deal. He was 39, going on 40 years old. So you knew it wouldn't be a long-term thing. Colt fans didn't love it his last year with the Chargers was not great. And then the same thing with Wentz coming over from Philadelphia and having to give up a first-round pick for Wentz. So I would say over the last three years bringing in those two quarterbacks and now bringing in Matt Ryan, I think with the fan base, it's been the easiest sell. And trading Wentz to Washington and trading for Matt Ryan, we actually accumulated more draft picks with the quarterback swap. And in my opinion, the quarterback improvement and upgrade in Indianapolis. So you know it won't be a super long-term fix you're still in this kind of like patch it up for another year, patch it up for another year. I do see maybe two, three years with Matt Ryan. He's going to be 37 in May. So, again, not a super long-term fix in Indianapolis, another Band-Aid, if you will. But right now the initial return by Colt fans is very optimistic with Matt Ryan coming into a loaded AFC. I would certainly agree that it's going to be more than a one-year deal. The Colts will break their streak, streak yep. of having a new quarterback every year for the last five years. Uh, I think they will get a minimum of two out of Matt Ryan. That being said, because, again, he's not long-term. I think the Colts believe when they traded for Carson Wentz, they were going to have him for years, which turned into singular one. So you never really know. Will they hedge their bet? Are the Colts going to be in the quarterback market come draft time? As far as pro days go, Ballard hasn't been to a single quarterback pro day, to my knowledge, and he hasn't sent Dobbs or any of the top guys in the Colts front office. So you never know if a guy falls down the board, if they do something in the mid to late rounds. But this isn't even a great quarterback draft early. Right. So I really just don't see it. We don't have a first-round pick, so I don't see the Colts taking a quarterback. Last year they take Sam Ellinger late, I believe, in the fifth round out of Texas. year before that they took a shot at Jacob Eason. Eason this past year released during the season when Ellinger became healthy, and I think he ended up in Seattle. I'm not sure if he's still in Seattle or if he is an unrestricted free agent, but as far as the last couple of years, they did take late-round shots in quarterbacks. I don't see that again i think they like sam ellinger as a backup in a backup role i do not see him being a successor to matt ryan but as far as the draft i don't see it and going back to last year this time last year you give up a first round pick of course you expect more than one year especially a guy in his 20s you do not expect him to come in for one year and then boom be done and trade him for less than you gave up to get him the previous year but that was split in house the entire Colts organization did not like that at the time including the owner who was against it from day one, but he trusted his head coach mainly who stood on the table for Carson being his offensive coordinator in Philadelphia. And that great 2017 season that Carson had under Frank Reich before getting hurt, unfortunately going into the playoffs, I guess maybe a little bit fortunate for Philly and then going on that run with Nick Foles and winning a Super Bowl. God knows how it would play out with Carson Wentz. But yeah, there was mixed emotions last year around this time, about 55, 56 weeks ago 
when the Colts made that trade with Philadelphia for Carson Wentz. And even Chris Ballard, not entirely on board. Of course, he pulled the trigger, and that trade is attached to his name. But that was a Frank Reich on the table head coach and the quarterback coach head coach who has a history in this league as a backup. The incredible comeback with Buffalo in the playoffs, standing on the table and banging the table for his guy, getting his guy, and then boom, a year later, basically apologizing. They're saying Ballard and the Colts righting a wrong from last year, trading Carson Wentz to Washington and then making the move for Matt Ryan. I am a little surprised. I had not heard what you just said about the discrepancy within their organization when they made the Wentz trade. I would certainly figure that Frank Reich was going to be the driving force, uh, and I thought Ballard was all for it. I did not know that the owner questioned it. There have been a lot of reports this year that the trade of Carson Wentz after his mediocre and uh, non-leading-the-troop season with the Colts was something that the guy who wanted him in town wasn't ready to move off him just yet, and it was the owner who really brought down the hammer and said, listen, we're moving this guy. Ballard, you make the best deal you can, but I do not want Carson Wentz as my quarterback next year. Is that an accurate stance that the owner basically dictated that the Colts were going to have another quarterback this year? Absolutely. It's 100%. And we reported it five days after the season. We said that the Colts will not bring back Carson Wentz. He will either be traded or he will be released. And the Colts would have released him if they were not able to find the proper trade partner or a trade partner period by March either 17th or 18th, depending on which day he was owed like a $5 million signing bonus guarantee going into 2022. So the Colts were off on Carson Wentz regardless heading into 2022. I do not believe that, because you might have said in there about Ursay convincing Ballard. Ursay and Ballard were on the same page. Ursay, at the end of the day, called the shot, and he said, we're basically done with him. But Ballard was on board after making the move last year. Because you look at a guy like Chris Ballard, and I think he's done a tremendous job. And you look at some of the names – and the drafts and year after year, pretty much outside of 2017 minus one really solid pick in Grover Stewart, you look at the 2018, 19, 20, 21 draft, he's done a phenomenal job. He's accumulated a ton of all pros, Pro Bowl caliber players, hasn't spent a ton of free agency, so he's done it the old-fashioned way. He's done it the hard way and really the best way in terms of contracts. Like you look at drafting Quinn Nelson and drafting Darius Leonard and making the trade for DeForest Buckner, so he's accumulated a lot and built up a lot of all-pro talent through the draft and through trade. He's done a great job really since 2018 with that. But when you look at the quarterback position, some of it's his fault, some of it's not his fault, going back to the Andrew Luck retirement, and this still is kind of a trickle-down from that. This is a guy who's only made the playoffs two times. He still has an under 500 record. Frank Reich comes in. They go to the playoffs that first year, miss the playoffs, make the playoffs, miss the playoffs. So, This is a regime that has one playoff win. Chris Ballard is going into year six now. He has one playoff win. So I think he's done a tremendous job through the draft. He's made some incredible trades. You look at that trade in 2018, trading back from three to six with the Jets getting all those picks that turns into Braden Smith and guys, Kamoko Ture. It was an incredible trade. He's done a really great job. He's built a really solid, talented roster. But at the end of the day, it's about win-loss. It's about what are you doing on the field? You're coming off a year where you missed the playoffs. You couldn't beat Jacksonville in Jacksonville week 18. They were basically going on vacation. They had vacation plans, travel plans, and you can't beat them to go to the playoffs when and you're in. So Chris Ballard and Frank Reich, they have work to do. The results need to turn up. So if you're Chris Ballard and you didn't like this quarterback this time last year, you get talked into the trade by your head coach, and you're looking at the clock. Eventually, your seat is going to heat up. You're going into year six with one playoff win. You haven't been to an AFC championship. Obviously, haven't been to a Super Bowl. Haven't won a Super Bowl. So the clock is beginning to tick on these guys, and I think he's very talented. I think he's done a relatively good job, but the results aren't there, period. I'll give you the two biggest reasons why Carson Wentz is now an ex-Indianapolis Colts, and I want you to break them down for me percentage-wise if these are the two reasons that Carson Wentz is no longer there. Number one is... Yeah, the the playoffs were there on a plate. All you had to do was grab it. He couldn't do it, couldn't beat Jacksonville. Don't make the playoffs. That's it. That's all. He's gone. Or 
the fact that Carson Wentz truly isn't the leader of men. And I watched Carson play his entire career in Philadelphia, and that was evident. He didn't have that bad a statistical last year, but he fell flat on his face at the end when the playoff and the money was on the line, and he also is never truly a leader. Which of those two things, give me percentage-wise, which was more so the reason Carson Wentz ended up being dealt? Jody, it's very difficult for me to say. Right, like I think moving on is more so number one. Like moving on right now, and actually, like Ursay getting to the point where he couldn't handle, like he literally couldn't handle another season, and he said, "You have to get this guy out. We're going to cut him." I think that is more so number one. The frustration, the buildup of the way they lost in Week 18, and Carson being awful down the stretch the final two weeks against the Raiders against the Jaguars. So I think ultimately, actually, like, the way it's set up, they're probably going to do this anyway, Matt Ryan being available and everything. But I think the way the organization turned on him was because they missed the playoffs and because Ballard and Reich felt their seats heating up. So they had to make a move. But if you go back to the off season and you go back to during the season, when we were hearing rumors from the organization that the Colts could potentially move on. Even after that Patriot game, I was hearing rumblings that it was not guaranteed he would be back next year. And that's what the Colts looked like. They were a shoe and they were a lock to the playoffs. Even at that time, I was hearing that there was a chance they would move on after 2021. So at that point, it was pure leadership. The statistics were fine. Season totals wise, they were fine. Interceptions were down. Touchdowns were up. All in all, he was having a better statistical season in Indianapolis than he had his final year in Philadelphia. But leadership, we come back to leadership. In August, we put out a report that Carson Wentz was not voted a team captain by the players. The Colts had six captains. Five of them were voted captain by their teammates. Carson Wentz was not. He was named captain, and we heard from a very reliable source within the Colts organization that Frank Reich did it because of an ego thing with Carson Wentz. He was not coachable in Indianapolis. He was not a true leader of men. And these things, everything we heard about him at the end of Philadelphia, it also happened again in Indianapolis. So they basically gave that to him. He was so fragile in terms of how the outside world was going to view him, even with the injury. They gave him a 5- to 12-week timetable for that angle heading into the season. 5- to 12 weeks is absurd. That's like saying we're going to get one to 32 inches of snow tomorrow night. That's just too big of a, of a gap. And then he's back three and a half weeks later, and he's there for opening day. They knew from the jump. And we reported it the day after it came out, five to 12 weeks, and everybody was saying he was going to miss time during the season. We reported he will be the opening day week one starter. And that was less than five weeks later with a five to 12 week timetable. So pretty much everything with, Frank Reich was basically catering to the cars that went. He can't handle the criticism. Everybody's saying he's injury prone. The guy's never completed a playoff game, let alone win a playoff game, because I think he's only played three or four snaps and then got that concussion against yep. Seattle. So he was very fragile coming into this year, and they babied him. They babied him by naming him captain when his teammates did not vote him captain, and the guy barely practiced this offseason. So logically, why would they have voted him captain? He didn't come in here the way Philip Rivers came in here, where he had a very successful career in accolades and actually came in and practiced the entire summer. So this is not a situation like that. This guy basically came in off a terrible statistical season in Philadelphia, practiced maybe two times, and then got hurt, missed the rest of the summer, and then, boom, the guy gets voted captain by his fellow teammates. When it took Quentin Nelson, what, four years to become a captain of this offense? So Carson Wentz was treated very interesting in Indianapolis. And if you go back and watch Hard Knocks, to me it's apparent that the locker room did not gravitate towards him the way they would gravitate towards a true leader and the way they would gravitate towards a quarterback the way Frank Reich wanted us to believe they gravitated towards him. And I don't think that'll be a problem with Matt Ryan going forward. Uh, Luke Diamond from – for the Culture Podcast, C-O-L-T-U-R-E, here with us on CBS Sports Radio. All right, um, Matt Ryan comes in. You know you've got arguably the best running, you certainly the best running back in football last year. The two best running backs in football just happen to be in the same division. <laughs> 
excuse me, I get choked up talking about Jonathan Taylor because he's a <laughs> Jersey kid who had the kind of season that he did, actually MVP consideration. We know the yep. Colts have as good, if not the best, offensive line of any team in the National Football League. Who are going to be the weapons on the outside? Who is Matt Ryan going to be throwing to? Are the Colts going to be able to either trade, free agency, in the draft, that they're going to be able to get him enough weapons because we know they can block for him and we know he can hand it off and Jonathan Taylor can move the ball, but when they need to throw it, who's he going to be throwing it to? That's a great question. I've been saying for years we cannot rely on Paris Campbell. Paris Campbell essentially had more surgeries since games played since entering the National Football League out of Ohio State. So I don't think you can rely on him. He's a house money player. I call him a house money player because if he's on the field, that's great. But right now, I don't even consider him part of the team because the guy literally never plays. So if he plays, that's great. You go from having a nobody on the roster to having a legitimate number two if he could stay healthy, which I do not believe he could stay healthy. So you basically have to X him out, and then you hope you could get him more than three or four games this year. Michael Pittman Jr., has turned into a number one, in my opinion, a number one at least on a bad receiving core like the Colts have had the last couple of years. They don't have a great receiving core. They have the old line, like you said, they have the best running back, or if not the second best running back in football, Jonathan Taylor, another really good running back behind him in Naheem Hines. So they have weapons in the backfield. They have the offensive line. Pittman is a number one. He's not your automatic number one to the level of like a Jamar Chase or guys like that that we've seen explode onto the scene. But his year one to year two jump with a downgrade at quarterback from Rivers to Wentz was very nice. So you expect him to take another step now going into year three with an upgrade at quarterback in Matt Ryan. But, yes, draft is going to be essential acquiring weapons. And Ballard has – bet on himself a lot in the draft in the past he was getting hammered about not having any linebackers going into 2018 did not address it in free agency then you come out of that draft with of course Darius Leonard who goes on to be he's a three-time first team all pro through four years if you look at Darius Leonard they also draft Zayer Franklin that year and Matthew Adams so that was a big linebacker year for the Colts the following year they draft Bobby Okariki so we've seen Ballard do that in the past Two years ago, he takes Michael Pittman Jr., so I expect him to go and double dip and go receiver in this draft, of course. But as far as free agents, there's guys out there. Like, I like Jarvis Landry, and I thought he would have fit on this team. If he's looking for $20 million a year, Ballard will never do that. There's still guys out there. There's a lot of guys also out there that just got hurt at unfortunate times. Like, a guy like Odell, maybe I'd look in his direction, but he's not going to be ready for week one, most likely. I mean, he tore his ACL in the Super Bowl, so you would assume – he wouldn't be ready. But the Colts are looking at guys in free agency, so I still expect them to sign somebody in free agency. And then you look, of course, towards the draft, and that's somewhere you're going to have to look. Definitely left tackle, which is a concern. As good as this offensive line is, Fisher was a weak link last year. They re-signed Pryor, so Pryor theoretically could be your week one starter. But I think left tackle and receiver are probably the two biggest needs as we head into the draft after really, or I guess heading to this next wave of free agency where the Colts really haven't done anything externally outside of making trades. The Yannick Ngakwe trade was a great trade. And then of course the Matt Ryan trade, another really good trade that I liked a lot, but yeah, receiver is definitely going to be an issue. Jack Doyle retires. You bring back Moali Cox. So I like Cox as a tight end, but you're going to have to also address that. Kylan Grant is going into year two. So you're going to need another tight end. You're going to need outside playmakers you're going to need receivers you cannot rely again you cannot rely on Paris Campbell because the guy just cannot stay healthy I do not believe T.Y. will be back I'm not sure but last year they were hesitant to bring him back he came back he didn't do anything he was hurt all year so I just don't see them bringing back a 30 plus year old T.Y. Hilton at this point and if you do can you rely on him no so receiver is definitely a position they're going to have to address but again I go back to last year nine and one in games where Jonathan Taylor ran for 100 plus yards Matt Ryan in his career, I believe, is 36-6 and six when he has a running back go for 100-plus. So last year with a worse quarterback and a poor to below average to poor wide receiver core, the Colts were able to go 9-1 and one in games where Jonathan Taylor ran for 100-plus. So you look at Matt Ryan, if you could give him that level of production on the ground, I think it will make guys – in the receiving game better because last year Carson Wentz just missed so many open guys like wide like T.Y. Hilton in that Raider game was wide open that's a walk-in touchdown Carson Wentz could hit him and Carson Wentz overthrows him by three or four yards I don't think that happens next year with Matt Ryan so 
they definitely need to address receiver, but at the same time, I think the addition of Ryan will automatically make a lot of guys that are already in that room just that much better. All right, let me throw one name your way. Last question. Um, name you didn't mention, but Darius Leonard did. A uh, guy who's caught a whole lot of balls from your new quarterback there in Indianapolis who's become a free agent because he was released in your division. What about Julio Jones rehooking up with Matt Ryan now in Indianapolis? Yeah, I think Julio makes sense, especially with the connecting the dots. I just don't know what he has left. It kind of reminds me of... Here's what he's got. Thing. He's better than Zach Pascal or T.Y. Hilton. Well, that's true, yes. Pascal is very good at the things that don't pop up on the stat sheet in terms of blocking and all that. But, yes, is he an upgrade from Zach Pascal in the receiving game? Yes. Is he an upgrade from T.Y. Hilton probably everywhere at this point in T.Y.'s career? Yes. I mean, it kind of brings me back to when Reggie Wayne was finished and we knew he was finished, and then they went out and brought in Andre Johnson and basically threw Reggie Wayne out the back door. And it's like, okay, we took our guy who was aging and over there, not to say that, T.Y. Hilton career-wise is in Julio Jones' category, but it kind of felt like that. Like, at the time, it's like, all right, you took one washed-up player and you replaced him with another washed-up player who wasn't our homegrown guy, and would they be doing that again here? I think it's worth the gamble. I do. I think it's worth the gamble because of the connection with Matt Ryan. Had we not have brought in Matt Ryan, maybe I would feel differently, but we also need more than one guy in the receiver room. So, yeah, it's a name that I definitely think should be considered as a guy you should bring in. You should see where he's at physically. You should give him a physical. You should get him in the building because he does have that chemistry with Matt Ryan. He's also very, he's a very similar receiver to Pittman in a lot of ways. So that could help Pittman just having a guy like that in the room as he progresses. And you don't need him to be the number one. Julio would not have to come in and be the number one, although he wasn't last year with A.J. Brown in Tennessee, but last year I think he played 10 games. I think he only had one touchdown, so production has been down. Injuries, of course, playing a factor as he gets up there, but it's definitely a guy I would take a look at, and it's not going to cost you $20 million a year like Jarvis Landry. I was out of his mind to think he's going to get. That's what I was going to say. It'll probably come down to dollars and cents. Luke, you yep. made a lot of sense with us. We appreciate you coming on board. Thanks much. Enjoy your continued offseason there in Indy. Thank you, Jody. Appreciate you having me on. My pleasure. Luke Diamond, a host and producer of the For the Culture podcast. Do love that name. All right, Jody Mac, coming back. Let's get the phones reopened. I still got to get this baseball stuff in. Uh, you want to make a quick NFL call, please do it. 855-212-4227. I am going to get some baseball in uh, before this hour comes and goes. That's a promise. Mac Man here with you on CBS Sports Radio.